Good morning and welcome to Greece Public Library's book break for Wednesday, August 26th. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose book discussion group as well as the virtual science fiction and fantasy book discussion group. And I am joined as always by my colleague Claire. Hello, I'm Claire. I um, moderate the As the Page Turns book group and also the Historical Fiction book group on Facebook. So. All right, and today I think we have no theme. We're just going to be talking about some of the stuff that we've been reading recently, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to start, Claire? Oh, sure, I'll start. I actually, <laughs> I actually read my book of the month club. Good Ooh. for me. Um, it was called The Night Swim by Megan Golden, and I just have been in the mood kind of like for mystery thrillers that I can mm -hmm. plow right through. And this one did the job for me. Um, the other thing, as you may know, I kind of like sometimes is true crime. So this mm -hmm. one was the best of both worlds because it is about a true crime podcaster. Mm. Um, so she's had two successful seasons. She has gotten a man freed from death row. And this season she's decided she is going to um, center her podcast in real life, real time around a rape trial that is going on mm. in North Carolina. Now, this is where, of course, you know, she's pulling from the headlines because it's a very young, rich, white swimmer who is destined for the Olympics, um, who has been charged. Yeah, does that sound familiar? <laughs> um, but the really interesting part is... Um, because she's a podcaster, she's well known for her voice, but mm -hmm. not many people know her face. And when she's mm -hmm. traveling to North Carolina, someone leaves a plea for help on her car addressed to her. So obviously they mm -hmm. A, know who she is. Um, and what they're asking for help is um, as a girl whose sister died in the same town 25 years ago, it was deemed a suicide, but she does not believe it. She thinks there was foul play involved, and she wants to get to the bottom of this mystery for her own healing, um, as well as to, to really know what happened and for justice to be done. So despite her, her instincts of, you know, being afraid, she gets involved. So you have these two narrators in the book. Um, you have the podcaster, and then you have the sister, um, who is Hannah, and uh, bringing you these two stories, which, mm -hmm. you know, of course, you, you can't stop reading once you begin to realize that people from today might be involved in the crime before and, and how they're involved. So um, it's what is the price of a reputation? It's also about, you know, shaming, um, bullying, mm -hmm. um, and the small town trying to cover up its secrets, if you will. Um, and then, of course, what really happened to the young girl, Jenny. So pretty good. I liked it. Um, if you nice. like real crime, if you like podcast, mm -hmm. if you like that dual narration thing, you know, this, the Night Swim checks all the boxes. I was just going to say, that's like my checklist. <laughs> yeah. Listen to true crime podcasts, like yeah. narrators. Yeah. All right. So that's going to go on my list. Um, I don't need to join the Book of the Month Club because I'm just going to borrow all of Claire's books once she's done with them. There you go. <laughs> that works for me. Kirstra lends me hers. We've got a good thing going here. Absolutely. Um, so I've also been in a place where, so I've been reading lots and lots of San, Santa Fe fantasy lately um, and also some horror thrown in there. And I was getting to a point where I was like, maybe... I need to take a little break or at least like intersperse some other things in there. Um, but like you, Claire, I wasn't really in the mood for anything super heavy. So I turned to my favorite fallback, the celebrity memoir. So I've got Why Not Me by Mindy Kaling. Um, I actually listened to this one on Libby, um, narrated by the author. Um, and it's one of those things where if you like Mindy Kaling, like if you find her charming and fun, you will really like this book. If you find her like obnoxious and grating, give it a miss. 
you will not like it. <laughs> so it really comes down to how you feel about her. Um, but I liked it. There was um, one of the things that I like about celebrity memoirs is kind of the like how the sausage gets made of Hollywood and entertainment. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that in here. Um, so Mindy Kaling, before she got her own show, was one of the writers on The Office and um, had, you know, a, uh, an acting part in The Office as well. So she talks about that. She talks about making the leap from being one of the writers to being a showrunner of her own show. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also stuff in there about, you know, being a woman in Hollywood and also being a woman of color in Hollywood. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. Um, it's a light, fun, very quick listen. Um, so again, if you like Mindy Kaling, I definitely recommend it. I think I read, didn't she read, Is Everybody Hanging Out Without mm -hmm. Me? Yeah, I yep. read that one. So. Yeah. I also like Tina Fey's Bossy Pants, if you... Yes. I, yeah, that one, yes. that one was funny. Um, and Amy Poehler's Yes, Please is yeah. also really good. Yeah. All right. Funny Women in Hollywood, send me your memoirs. I, will I like funny women. <laughs> so the next one I have, um, when I was shelving the books, and this is what's happening to me lately, <laughs> is I'm taking books off the cart and taking them mm -hmm. home. So this is called... Two Places by Sonia Yorg, I think. Um, and well, of course, what attracted me was the Blue Ridge Mountains. I saw that and was like, oh, <laughs> looks like it's in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Got my name on it, you know. So, but um, this is it's not a thriller at all, but it was very much a family saga. And the main character was Suzanne Blakemore. Suzanne um, has what everyone, you know, aspires is the, the perfect life, you know, wealth, um, husband, two children, but beneath the veneer, her life is pretty much falling apart. Um, her daughter is rebelling, her son is withdrawing, her husband is obsessed with his business ventures, um, and she's increasingly feeling like, is this all there is in my mm. life? You know, her mom, um, very domineering. Her parents were the ones that actually had the wealth. So um, lo and behold, one day she just decides she is fed up with her routine and she starts driving the Blue Ridge Parkway and she notices on the side of the road a young girl who seems to be in a lot of distress. So she stops, she pulls over, um, tries to help her and it ends up taking her to the hospital because she can mm -hmm. see she's in pretty bad shape. And this is where the interesting part is because um, this young girl is Iris and her parents were, oh, like off the gritters. Mm. Um, so she really has not interacted much in modern day society. She has lived on her own for a while because her father disappeared and her mother died. So for the past like several years, she's actually survived in hmm. the wilds on her own doing things that her mom had taught her. Um, so she's malnourished, she's, you know, got an infection which has brought her to the hospital. Um, so they can't find any family. Uh, so Suzanne gets the idea that she would like to foster Iris. Um, of course, her husband and children are thrilled, thrilled with this <laughs> idea. Um, so you kind of see how they're trying to acclimate um, Iris in Suzanne's husband knows that he's losing her, but he can't figure out why, you know, he's so mm -hmm. much in the present, like our life is good. Why would anyone want a different life that he doesn't realize that there was a lot more to Suzanne before she met him. Mm -hmm. And you start to really, you know, actually the one problem I have with this book is the book is more about Suzanne than it is about Iris. I really wanted to know more about the wild child growing up in the woods <laughs> and why, you know, that happened. Um, mm -hmm. But eventually they come to a, a, you know, a pretty good resolution where she can get her in a different environment and she gets a better life for herself. And I don't want to give too many spoilers and give mm -hmm. it away, but um, there is a lot of soul searching um, and a lot of commentary on just what constitutes a good life here mm -hmm. in America. And um, 
just the over consumerism and consumption of everything and materialism. It's yeah, it makes you kind of want to hide under a rug, you know. But yeah, but uh, it was it was good. It was something different. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. So maybe good for also people who liked um, where the crawdads sing, kind of that same like wild child yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Only this site, like I said, was more about the the mother who took mm -hmm. her in and okay. the wild child. Although you definitely get her perspective, but that one was much more character driven by the girl. Got it. You know? Okay. But um, but still, yeah, probably they might enjoy this. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Um, so my next book is actually uh, one from my stack of shame, which I'm super excited about. I'm reading one from your stack of shame. Not my <laughs> own, mine? Of course, but yours. <laughs> I just started Mexican Gothic last night. Oh, time. yes. I saw that come in on hold for you. Um, so this was actually one of my runners up. It is Upright Women Wanted by Sarah Gailey. Um, and this was such an interesting little book. And it is little it's re it's almost a novella like it is a very small book um but on the cover the little tagline here is um are you a coward or are you a librarian so already like what? i said to like it i know so um the book is set in sort of um like an alternate america timeline um there's been some sort of Disaster maybe, or maybe just ongoing wars forever and ever, but it's almost a post-apocalyptic society where there's still some um, vestiges of technology, um, but there's, there's no grid anymore. Like the military has um, like trucks and machinery, um, but most people do not like you have to be extremely wealthy or connected to have access to diesel. Um, so the book is set in the Southwest um, in the Arizona territory. Um, so everyone is riding around on horseback. It's basically like a post-apocalyptic Western <laughs> almost. Um, and our main character um, is Esther. And she has run away from the small town where she lived, um, running away from an arranged marriage um, to a man who was previously engaged to her best friend. And there's some more backstory there that I don't want to spoil. Um, so she runs away and stows away with the librarians who are like traveling on horseback with a wagon of approved materials distributing like books to these tiny little desert communities. Hack yes. librarians. <laughs> yes, yes, it's amazing. So she stows away um, and the action of the book really starts when she gets discovered in the librarian's wagon. Um, and she starts realizing that maybe the librarians are not exactly what they appear to be. Um, and it's like a like a little coming of age story for Esther, where she's learning about herself and learning to be um, self sufficient and kind of getting ready to take charge of her own destiny. Um, so it's it's fun. It is a western. There are like horseback gun battles um, with the librarians. <laughs> It's amazing. Um, it sounds awesome. Yeah. I know there are LGBTQ characters in there um, and just kind of a very different vision of the future. Um, but it was a fun read, like I said, a very quick read. Um, but I highly recommend it's like, when else are you going to read about horse riding, gun toting librarians? Yeah. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> And what's wrong with that, you know? Nothing. Nothing yeah. is wrong with it. <laughs> right. All right. My last one. Hopefully I can say the author's name. If not, I'll just, uh, The Absolution. And this is Urs Ursa Sigurds, Sigurds da Darder. Sigurd a daughter? I I, I'm leaving it to you. <laughs> Ten points for Gryffindor. Uh, yeah. So this was supposedly i picked this up because i like those kind of scandinavian mysteries are mm -hmm. just different than ours they're a little yeah. bit darker a little you know mm -hmm. 
more unsettling and I'm not always in the mood for it, but, um, and this one is set in Iceland, which is one of those places that's like been on my travel bucket list. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Corona, we'll stay on there for a little while, but <clears throat> I digress. But anyway, um, it's interesting because it, the murder starts out kind of with a bang. Um, and the crimes are committed and sent to people on Snapchat. So hmm. you begin to wonder right there, like why, you know, the killer uses the, the, the girl's phone and then sends these images out. So they hit her family and friends. Yeah, pretty bad. Do not like. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> um, the parent of teens. Do not like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I could not read these books when my daughters yeah. were, were, you know, I, I had to stay away from all kinds of stuff, but, um, mm -hmm. but they kind of get through that quickly. So they're not okay. like constantly doing that, but, but like all Scandinavian or, you know, they are, they are dark. Um, so the detective on the case is, uh, <laughs> and this was translated too. So sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's a little choppy and I wonder mm. if it's because of the translation from Icelandic to English, but, um, Okay, the, the detective uh, was disciplined for sexual harassment for his female superior. He also kind of had a one night stand with the, the child detective that is brought in for the case, who he is still, I believe, trying to uh, get, you know, get with. But um, so it's a lot of interesting things mm -hmm. going on there. Um, not obviously well respected in his department, but he has a lot of talent with researching cases mm -hmm. and really good instincts, so they don't get rid of him. Um, so it, it's just, um, and before you know it, another one happens, and this time it's a young, mm -hmm. young man. Um, so they're tying it in to different things, and really the, the psychologist begins to realize it's a bullying thing. Could be you know, revenge, like they're trying to figure out who. Um, it's a kind of thing that's not really pleasant, but you just can't stop reading, you know, it's, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so if you're in the mood for a really dark kind of Scandinavian failure, for all the new people that like the girl in the spider's web, well, mm -hmm. here's a new author for you. And um, I didn't feel like, although I jumped in, I, I haven't read book one and two, I didn't feel uh. like Oh my gosh, I don't understand the backstory. You kind of get the okay. backstory pretty quickly with how this detective has kind of screwed up his life with, you know, his love affairs. Um, so that didn't really seem to make a difference. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. All right. I do like a good uh, Nordic thriller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually yeah. better read in winter, but, you know. Yeah. I saw it, like I said, shelving and grabbed that one too. So there we have nice. it. Nice. Nice. Excellent. Um, so my last one, I have one more nonfiction. This one is my uh, serious book for this time. Um, it is Stay, uh, Say Nothing, um, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keith. Um, so I am going to date myself here. Uh, I was not aware of much of the troubles in Northern Ireland growing up. I'm a little bit too young to really have been like following current events um, in Northern Ireland. Um, but um, Ireland and Irish history has an, an, is an interest of mine. Um, and I was aware of, you know, just very generally pop culture wise of the troubles. So, you know, you two and the cranberries and various movies and things. Thank you, you two for, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm saying bloody Sunday. Now I, now I know what that was about. Right. Um, so the book is really interesting. This is another one that I listened to on Libby um, and the narrator is from or Northern Ireland. Uh, the author is American, but the narrator is from Northern Ireland. So you get that gorgeous Northern Irish accent and oh. he knows how to say all of the names and places <laughs> the way they're meant to be said, which is nice. Um, but the book is framed around the story of Jean McConville, who was um, a mother of 10 and was disappeared, like dragged from her home and never seen again. Um, and everyone but everyone knew that it was the IRA that disappeared her. Um, but 
no one ever was willing to talk like her kids um, just essentially never saw their mother again and ended up um, most of them in care and in various situations and it just tore their family apart um, so the author uses her story as kind of a frame to get into all of the other um, not all of the other issues but um, the story of the IRA and Sinn Féin and how um, kind of they got started in the modern era um, of the Troubles. Um, so Jean McConville disappears in 1972. That's about when um, the Troubles really started getting bad. Um, and the story takes us all the way through um, the 70s and 80s, through the worst of the Troubles, um, and then into the 90s when Sinn Féin, which is the political arm of the IRA, um, started coming into more power and there were um, ceasefires and peace deals starting to be brokered in Northern Ireland. Um, and right up until um, Jean McConville's remains are finally discovered, buried on a beach in 2003. So it's 30 years. Um, before her family had any answers really about what happened. Um, oh, gosh. I know. Um, but it's, it's just fascinating. And um, one of the major uh, points of the book is this project that I was not aware of at all um, through Boston College um, of essentially an oral history of the Troubles. So there were interviewers and they sat down and recorded interviews with um, all kinds of people involved in the IRA um, who were out there doing disappearings and um, like actively taking part in domestic terrorism um, or acts of revolution, you know, however you want to frame it, um, under the condition that um, those interviews would be sealed until after the interviewees passed. Like, the stricture on silence is so strong um, that that was the only way they could get anyone to actually talk honestly about what happened during that time period. Um, so of course, the, the interview project doesn't stay secret, and that ends up being a whole other issue a little bit later. But it's, it's really a fascinating book, um, and the author does a fantastic job of taking um, a huge cast of characters and a really sort of dense subject matter and presenting it in a way that's really easy to follow and understand. Um, so there's all kinds of things that like, um, like there's a bit where he talks about the hunger strikes and like the Bobby Sands, who was not the first, but one of the most famous hunger strikers to actually pass away during that time. Um, and I learned all kinds of things, like the actor Stephen Ray, who was in The Crying Game, which is a book, uh, movie about the IRA, was actually married to an IRA operative, who's one of the main characters in the book. Oh, wow. So, I did not know. Um, so there's all kinds of things. and it really took sort of these little facts that were kind of floating around in my consciousness and did a great job of sort of weaving them all together into a cohesive narrative. Um, so it's, it's really, really fascinating. And he doesn't get into everything. Like there's not a lot from the perspective of um, the Republicans um, in Ireland but that's not what he set out to do. It really is a story about the IRA and that he does really, really well. So if you have any interest in Ireland or uh, Northern Ireland or political history, um, this is a really, really fascinating read. Um, and don't let the size of it scare you. It's um, presented in a really, really clear and easy to understand way. So highly, right. highly recommend. Gosh, a mother of 10. I know. It, it, yeah. And it's really, really sad. 
what happens to the rest of the family. Like um, kids end up in orphanages, which I don't know if you know this, but orphanages in Northern Ireland in the late seventies were not a great place to be. No, you don't no. want to be there. No. So, and it just shows how, um, you know, it, one of his points is that disappearing as opposed to just murdering someone outright is um, a much more uh, devastating act because the family has no closure. Right. And how that really has repercussions for a long, long time yeah. through a family. So yikes. Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, bringing it down for the end. <laughs> um, but a really, really good book. So. Awesome. Well, I think that's all we have today, unless you have any final thoughts. No, nope, just tune in next time. I think next yes. month we're going to, one of our sessions, we're going to talk <coughs> about some me. of our classics. So, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm excited about that one. Me too. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you in September. Bye-bye.